Hey everybody, a uh, quick lecture here about the nature of communities. We're sort of moving out of population ecology and into community ecology. And so this is sort of the introduction for community ecology. Uh, let me go ahead and get the, the slide started. Switch this over. All right, so this is chapter 16 in your textbook. The key concepts we're going to cover today are that communities are groups of interacting species that occur together at the same place and time. And their species diversity and species composition are important descriptors of community structure. And communities can be characterized by complex networks of direct and indirect interactions at the very, um, that vary in strength and direction. And um, just to give you a heads up, there's likely to be a, um, an exercise associated with the sort of um, calculating species diversity and varying species diversity uh, from different community types. And this is sort of where I was wanting you to go with your iNaturalist um, project. So this, uh, this is a good topic, good set of topics in the next few chapters to think about with your iNaturalist projects. So as an introduction, uh, so far we've considered species interactions and two-way relationships. So you think about predator-prey, commensalism, mutualism, competition, those types of interactions. Um, however, in reality, species experience multiple interactions that shape communities where, where they live. And so, uh, as an example, you can see this um, fish here on, on the left of the screen is a bluehead chub, and this mound of rocks behind it is its nest. These guys pick up uh, with their mouth up to about 8,000 rocks and move them into this giant mound um, in a stream, and then they reproduce on there. And um, and so that's a single species that builds that, but all these other species on your right over here, and I think there are maybe three species that I can pick up on there, maybe four, uh, all use this mound for reproductive purposes. And so some of them use different parts of it. There are also insects that will prey on the eggs. Um, things like crayfish might hide out in there and, and try to capture fish. Uh, there are, of course, um, bacteria that live in there, et cetera. So there's a lot of species to hang out in there, so you have this community associated with these um, these mounds that the, the blue-headed chub builds for their reproduction. So what is a community? In a, a community, in practical terms, um, is what ecologists usually define as, um, or ecologists usually define communities based on their physical or biological characteristics. So you can think about the physically defined community um, as an example, all species in a sand dune, mountain stream, or desert. And then a biologically defined community is one in which all the species associated with a kelp forest or coral reef. So you can see the, the differences there. Um, so you think about in a uh, physically defined, we have a mountain stream down here in the bottom left. And all of the uh, species that, that live in and around or live in that, that stream. Um, we could extend that into the riparian area or all, even all the organisms that, that interact with the stream. And then biologically defined, we think about all the species that are associated with the kelp forest, with the coral reef, um, with a hot spring, et cetera. So you can think about how we define species. Ecologists use these terms somewhat interchangeably, and we sort of need to be sure we define them when we are talking about them. So ecologists often define a community arbitrarily um, based on the questions they're posing. Um, so as an example, a study of aquatic insects and their amphibian predators might restrict the community to that interaction and not include the role of birds um, or other uh, or fish or other organisms that interact with them. Um, counting all the species in, co is co in a co uh, counting all the species in a community is essentially impossible. Um, and there are multiple reasons for this. Uh, this is especially if small or unknown species are considered. So you can think about it even down to bacteria and the impossibilities of counting all the different species of bacteria in a given area. Uh, eco ecologists usually consider a subset of species when they define and study communities. So um, they may uh, think about a subset of species by their taxonomic affinity, so all of the birds and species in the community. So in this upper um, portion, this A panel of this figure, are all the bird species. And so that would be the taxonomic affinity, how many different species of birds there are. And then we can think about a guild, a group of species that use the same resource. So for example, a guild would be all the species um, in a forest that use uh, flowers. So we have, for example, a fruit bat or bat, um, and then a hummingbird and a bee of some sort. 
And then also functional groups. So you can think about species that function in similar, similar ways. Um, and so in this example in panel C, the function that these um, plants provide is that they're all nitrogen fixers. Um, and then what is a uh, community continued? You can think about we um, like to consider food webs uh, that or as organizing species based on their trophic or energetic interactions. And we um, use these different levels of trophic, um, trophic ecology. So they're primary producers. Those are autotrophs, things that uh, like plants that produce their own energy. And then there are primary consumers, those things that eat the plants. Okay, so you can think about um, cattle, deer, things of that nature. Secondary consumers uh, are carnivores, so they consume the primary, um, the, uh, uh, the primary consumers or the second level. And then tertiary consumers are those that consume um, the um, secondary consumers or can, could consume the primary consumers also. You can also think about the sort of difficulties with this when you think about trophic ecology from the standpoint of uh, an example, a grizzly bear might um, well eat a, an elk, um, which would be a, a primary consumer. It also might eat a, um, a wolf or a, a coyote if it can catch it. Um, and then they also eat, um, eat plants sometimes as well. So there are a lot of difficulties with this. And this sort of leads us to um, this other uh, idea of an interaction web. Um, and food webs, so food webs tell a little about the strength of the interactions of the, or the importance in the community. Some of the species span two trophic levels. Um, so for example, omnivores like the bear we were just talking about. Uh, there's idealized food webs uh, that rarely, they rarely include all of these important elements. Um, for example, uh, symbionts and detritivores. Uh, food webs tell a little about the strength of the interactions and their importance in the community. Uh, some of the species span two trophic levels. Some change feeding status as they mature. Um, and again, some are omnivores. Um, and I copied and um, repeated that all again, sorry. Um, but you can see this, this um, figure on the right here is an interaction web where it includes the trophic uh, interactions. But you see that energy flows from the plant to the herbivore, also from the plant to the, quote, carnivore. And then there are these interactions that are horizontal as well, and these can be um, competitive or mutualism or commensalism um, in, in uh, predator relationships, predator-prey relationships also. Um, so um, looking a little more about community structure, uh, community structure is a set of characteristics that shape the communities, provides the basis for generating hypotheses and experiments to understand how communities work. So, Ecologists try to consider community structure a lot when they're thinking about um, their various experiments or various uh, studies that they're going to do. Um, and a few terms, species diversity is the most common measure of community structure. We're going to take a look uh, at that a little bit more in a minute. Um, species diversity combines both species richness, in other words, the number of species, and species evenness, or the relative abundances. Um, in an example, um, both communities have the same species richness. Species A is dominated by one species, and species B is, um, has much higher diversity. So we have here, you can see that there are the same number of species. There are three different butterfly species, or four different butterfly species. This pink butterfly, this orange with the black tips, this orange butterfly looks sort of like a monarch. And then these, this black species. So in community A, however, this sort of dark black species butterfly uh, really um, dominates the, the, uh, the community. However, in community B, you see that there's a much greater uh, evenness of uh, species. So the, the number of species is the same, but there's a more even uh, count for all of those species. And so this would have a higher species diversity. The other thing that I want to make about um, species diversity and richness is that in, um, depending on the, um, the study, for example, um, in, in, a, um, in a paper that I uh, helped write, we were looking at, um, uh, of looking at a study across the Appalachians, the Southern and Central Appalachians, I was doing the aquatics part. And in high altitude mountain streams, we have really low richness and low, uh, hence low species diversity. And in some streams, there may be only two species of fish, for example, brook trout and mottled sculpin, or maybe three. We add in a black-nosed dace. However, um, those streams we know are really high quality. 
And uh, as we move downstream, we get into areas where we may have 10, 15, 20 species of fish, but um, those, those streams may not be as quality, high quality of stream. They may be, be pretty impacted by human, um, human actions. And so we have to consider when we're thinking about our, our study area and uh, the study that we're doing, we have to think about those different things and how best to represent species diversity for, um, our, or our community. So as an example, we have um, these three different communities, community A, community B, and community C. And we have these one, two, three, four, five different um, species represented in each of the communities. So in, um, or in, in community A, you see that we have three different species and three individuals of each species, but we have pretty low numbers uh, of, of the number of species. In community B, we have a lot more species. As a matter of fact, I think all the species are represented, all five, but you can see again that the black species, um, the, the uh, hexagon certainly outweighs all the other species. And then in um, community C, you can see that we have a pretty even spread of all the species. So if we look at that, we can see that um, sample A has a species richness of three, species sample B or population B has five, and population C or community C has um, five as well. But then we have these, um, these indices, and I'm gonna have you guys work with these a little bit in an exercise, I believe. Um, but you can see that our species diversity, the Simpson index, um, Sample A is four um, because it has a lot of evenness and but low numbers. And then sample um, sample B is really low, 1.94. has all the species, but is dominated by one species. And then, of course, sample C has the greatest. And then if we look at um, the, the pattern is the same for the Shannon Wiener um, Species Diversity Index. But you can see that it's, um, it's not the spread isn't as great in these um, in the, in the index between the, the communities. So that's just a quick example of how, um, how looking at the different, at three different communities and how the numbers and the numbers of, numbers of uh, individuals and numbers of species affects community structure. Um, and so this is clearly the quote winner. Um, so com community structure continued. Um, species diversity and biodiversity are often used more broadly to mean the number of species in a community. Um, however, biodiversity describes diversity at multiple spatial scales, and it can include um, levels from genes to species to communities. And implicit in this uh, definition is that inter the interconnectedness of all the components. So you can see, for example, in the upper part of this figure, um, there is a, I believe, supposed to be a single species of butterfly, and this butterfly has quite a bit of genetic diversity, and so you see these variants. And then that butterfly species makes up an insect community, and then that insect community makes up this greater um, sort of Rocky Mountain uh, ecosystem community. Um, so how do we look at community structure a little bit uh, further? We can think about rank abundance curves, and these are where we plot the proportional abundance of each species relative to the others in rank order. Um, and it can suggest possible species interaction. So you see in this figure above, that we have really high abundance, proportional abundance of this first species in community A. Community A is red, and then low, really low um, abundance of these other three species. However, you see in community B that we have sort of an, we have very even distribution in terms of proportional abundance um, for the, the species. And then um, species accumulation curves are often also used, and this is where species richness is plotted as a function of total number of individuals that are counted. And these curves help us determine uh, when the most or uh, all of the species in a community have been, been observed. So essentially what we're trying to do is figure out where, how much sampling effort we need, so how many individuals we need to count and you know, capture in order to capture all the species um, that are living in, this, in a given area. And you can see that you can make sort of decisions um, based on this about your sampling protocol, for example. So you may want to capture 90% of all the species and feel comfortable with that. And so you may be able to sample um, fewer than, than if you wanted to capture 95% or something like that. Um, species composition, um, the identity of species in a community. So two communities could have identical species diversity values, but completely different species. 
And this is really important to consider because the species um, composition may, may be quite, uh, quite bad in one of the communities. So it could be a really impacted stream, for example. Um, and it may have only, as we as I mentioned earlier, uh, three species where a, another really good um, community might have three species, but, but, the, um, but the, the two streams are very different. Or even um, two streams might have, one might have really high diversity, and that would be because there are a lot of tolerant individuals that live, that live there in base of species. And so the, identi uh, the identity of species is critical to understanding community structure. Um, so we need to be able to identify um, the species that are within the, the community. And so this is one, um, the reason I wanted you guys to use iNaturalist is because I felt like um, using iNaturalist would allow you to sort of expand your ability to identify species. Um, all right, and um, in a community, multiple species interactions generate many uh, connections. There are both direct and indirect interactions. So in direct interactions, there's this direct connection between two species. And then in indirect uh, interaction, there's a relationship between two species is mediated by this third species or even more. And this is often only discovered after a species is removed to study interactions that are direct. Um, trophic cascade is something else that I wanted to talk about, and I gave you guys a paper um, maybe a couple chapters ago about um, wolves, coyotes, and pronghorn, and um, there's a bit of a trophic cascade uh, or trophic interaction there. Sort of the uh, most well-known trophic cascade that's been really well studied is the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone National Park. There are several documentaries made about that, and um, it's a good one to watch if you're interested in tro trophic cascades. Um, where the wolves, when the wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone, uh, it caused elk to leave the low areas, uh, particularly in the summer. And they would graze on a lot of willows down in the lowlands. Uh, once the willows were able to come back, uh, a lot of um, other things came back. So beavers, for example, were able to come back into the area. They dammed up the area. A lot of uh, waterfowl, other songbirds came by, back. The riparian areas uh, sort of flourished. So it's really interesting uh, trophic cascade. And so in a tra trophic cascade, the rate of consumption at one trophic level, level results in change in species abundance or composition at lower levels. So carnivore eats er an herbivore. There's a direct negative effect on the herbivore, and this decreases the herbivore abundance as a positive effect on the primary producer. So you can see in this figure on the right, this is another really uh, sort of classic example where there's a sea otter. They eat urchins, and the urchins eat kelp. And so as the um, sea otter eats the urchins, then the um, kelp is sort of released from that urchin pressure. And so the carnivore, the um, sea otter, has a positive effect on the primary producer or the, um, or the, the kelp. And um, trophic facilitation is another example. And in this situation, a consumer is indirectly facilitated by positive interaction between its prey and other species. So um, in this example, um, the, um, these two plant species have a positive effect on one another and also has a positive effect on this aphid. And so because of this interaction that these two have on one another, this uh, first species of plant has, also has a, um, a facilitated uh, effect on the aphid where that is also positive. Um, and then... Um, in community, multiple species interaction generate connections. Uh, oh, I just did that, sorry. Um, I was going the wrong way. Um, all right, so competitive networks. These are interactions among multiple species in which every species has a negative effect on every other species, and no one species dominates the interaction, allowing for coexistence. So you can see these um, this competitive network here, and then here is a key. And so this is sort of an interesting concept because uh, previously we learned about uh, competition between two species and if uh, one species can really have a detrimental effect driving the other species all the way to extinction. However, because of this competitive network, there are these interactions between the three different species and they're all negative and it actually causes each of the species um, to, to be able to coexist. Um, we can also think about interaction strength, and so um, the interaction strength is the magnitude of the effect of one species on the abundance of another. 
measured by removing one species, the interactor species, from the community and observing its effect on the other species or the target species. If removal of the interactor species uh, results in a large decrease in the target species, then the interactor species has a strong positive effect on the target species. And then the opposite true, it holds true as well, where it would be negative. And the interaction strength may actually uh, depend on the environmental factors as well. So for example, uh, there's a study done on the coast um, out west where um, you see um, the uh, sea stars uh, prey on mussels. And so there was um, interest in whether or not there was a difference in the interaction strength between areas that were exposed to waves and areas that were protected from waves. So you can see that the interaction uh, strength was much greater when there were, the area was protected from waves. And so the, um, the sea stars were able to, to be much more efficient predators, for example. Um, another um, thing we want to talk about are foundation species. And these have large effects on other species and thus species diversity and by virtue of their considerable abundance or biomass. And an example of their trees. So some foundation species are also ecosystem engineers. They can create, modify, or maintain physical habitat for themselves and other species. Um, and so you can see in the, the figure on the right all of these different um, things that trees do that um, allow them to act as foundation species and also potentially ecosystem engineers. They have leaves, branches, and trunk that provide habitat for other species. They affect the local temperature, reduce moisture, or increase moisture. Uh, or change moisture, I guess, depending on the, the search and circumstances. Um, trees, um, they can fall to the forest floor. That increases habitat for some species. They provide seeds. They um, also provide um, microbial um, uh, habitat. Tree roots can aerate the soil. They can anchor um, and bind rocks and stabilize the forest floor. Uh, if they fall, they can serve as nurse logs, providing space and nutrients for moisture for seedlings. So they, uh, you can see that they sort of dominate the ecosystem and they are ecosystem engineers in that way. Uh, next is keystone species. And these guys have strong effects because of their role in a community. And um, their effect is large in proportion to their biomass or abundance. They usually influence the community structure indirectly via trophic means, as is the case for sea otters. Some keystone species are also e ecosystem engineers. So you can see in the figure below that a beaver, for example, um, builds a dam, it builds a lodge, they go around and um, um, and because of the dam they of course flood a larger area so there's a change in a river, it becomes much more um, of a lentic system where there are there's standing water so the fish community is likely to change, the insect community is likely to change, there may be some aquatic vegetation that emerges. The surrounding forests they can damage quite a bit and change the riparian area so they are indeed ecosystem engineers. Um, and even at the landscape level, beavers can create a mosaic of wetlands uh, within a larger forest community, which increases regional biodiversity. So um, between uh, 1940, um, down here, 1940 to 1986, in an area in Minnesota, there was a 13-fold increase in wetlands across this region. So they can be uh, ecosystem engineers, not just locally, but regionally at the landscape scale. And that's it. So we will... Um, conclude here and I'll pick back up and see you guys soon in the next chapter.